Hello and a very warm welcome to today's session brought to you by Team Biochoos Exam Prep. I hope all of you are doing really well. I hope all of you celebrated your weekend well or Mother's Day as well today, uh, really well. Uh, today with the course, uh, like you know, with the course of this, uh, through the course of this entire video lecture on YouTube, we'll try to review a couple of important questions, some important aspects that are commonly being asked in your examination as well. Uh, that is going to be a priority. We'll look at uh, some simpler questions and then moving forward we'll move on to a slightly difficult questions uh, so without further ado i think let's just quickly get started uh, and if time permits we'll also try and look at a passage based question otherwise we'll continue that in the next lecture and uh, we'll try to give a proper overview of how you can approach those kind of questions as well so without further ado let's just very quickly get started with today's session good evening everybody good evening uh, so glad that all of you have joined on time so get set get ready for your questions that are just coming uh, around the corner just give me one second i'm just changing the deck uh because this is not the correct one here we go. All right. So uh, like I said, we're going to be looking at questions. Let's just try to wrap up as many questions as possible via today's session. Uh, the questions are relatively fine, simpler, not that difficult, but they've all been extracted from, they've been culled out from papers, pre previous years questions, uh, questions that have been asked in your uh, recent entrances. So that has been the priority for us to figure out, you know, how we can probably chalk out the plan for these classes. So without further ado, I think let's just quickly uh, get started. I will be sharing the agenda for today. So today's agenda will be to practice our weekly questions for, uh, you know, the, the, the questions that can be asked, having a structured approach towards our examination preparation. Good evening. I can see Anna, Siali, Somi, Zamar, Kriti, Bing Tenzing, Juhi, uh, Vismai, Lidji, Surbi. Everybody is there. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. All right. So without further ado, I think let's just very, very quickly get started with today's session. This is your Sunday Weekly Express, where we try to cover up questions, where we try to look at questions, where we try to wrap up questions, especially those questions which are very important from your examination perspective. That, of course, becomes the priority for all of us to look at. Uh, how can you approach these classes? Just make sure that all of you are trying to uh, write things down in a very organized manner, understanding the writers who are commonly being asked, understanding why these writers are being asked in your examination. That, of course, also becomes important. Uh, also, please keep that in mind. Be very structured while documenting the notes for these classes. Don't just think that, okay, you're just solving the questions. But topic-wise, you will have to look at it. For instance, if there's a question on Jacobian tragedy, just see, have you covered Jacobian tragedy entirely? Or if there's a question, say, on postmodernist writings, just see whether you've covered postmodernist writings entirely or not. That, of course, is also equally important, okay? So always keep that in mind. Always keep that as a priority. Uh, here we start with your Sunday express this is a really simple question the phrase dark satanic mills right so that's the question being asked to all of you the phrase dark satanic mills appears in which poem by william blake in in which poem are we able to see that this phrase the dark satanic mills is appearing by william blake so in which poem are we able to see that this particular term is being asked the dark satanic mills that we are looking at which work, which writing are we able to see that the writer is talking about? So you've got these uh, options as well. Why is this pen not working? Just give me one second. Oh, oh, oh. <clears throat> not connected. Right, I'm just going to be looking at the uh, options also, like uh, the comments section, that how many of you have started answering it correctly. Some of you have given your options as well in the comments section. Uh, let's just see your comments. Absolutely right. See, these kind of questions will come in your exams. So be uh, prepared for such kind of questions as well on romanticism. We've been talking about that in general as well. Now, if you look at this, this is actually coming from Jerusalem, right? Dark Satanic Mill. It was used by William Blake in his writing called Jerusalem. Uh, so Jerusalem, which was written as a sort of a preface to his epic, Milton, a poem in two books. Milton, a poem in two books. So there was a work that he was writing, Milton, a poem in two books. 
a poem in two books jerusalem was considered to be the preface of this book jerusalem was supposed to be the preface of this particular book right and as it is blake is a sui generis he's trying to highlight he's trying to tell us that you know it's a new kind of writing that he's getting into and in this poem jesus is visiting england and blake equates it with the creation of paradise which according to him is in sharp contrast with the hell of the dark satanic mills in the industrial era so clearly we are able to see and this is exactly what we were discussing previously as well that uh, there is this socially purposive literature which is coming there is uh, the creation of a socially purposive literature that we are able to see especially when we are uh, getting into the period of romanticism romantic literature is democratization of literature it is talking about how uh, literature needs to ensure and needs to become socially purposive socially driven socially motivated that is becoming a priority for most of these writers okay so please keep that aspect in mind okay moving on to the next question so i hope all of you will remember this uh, do cover do make short notes on transition poets sources that you can use for making notes on your transition poets you can actually consult the uh, the poetry manual of the ignu book mag 06 and 07 to make notes on transitional poets cover all the transitional poets there are questions that come on almost all of them uh, you should be knowing about the most important works of those writers and they come as it is in your exams okay there's another question which of these was own was the only published poem of george herbert during his own lifetime 17th century poetry is also a topic that you should be uh, able to cover it bit by bit 17th century drama 17th century prose 17th century poetry very important leviathan all the kinds of different writings diary writer 17th century is a very active period it's a very very active period right so that is of course there yes so me we are going to be coming up with some theoretical lectures as well in the coming days uh, but duly duly taken absolutely duly duly taken so we're coming up with some uh, other extra things also on youtube as well for all of you to help you out so uh, yes definitely great 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 most of you have started answering it i was just writing down sony's um, comment as well as the feedback uh, so yes of course that is the right answer most of you in the comment section are answering the right answer so uh, you know here you need to understand that the work that george herbert george herbert 1593 to 1633 he is actually now considered to be a member of the metaphysical school of poets herbert was getting a lot of popularity he was writing devotional lyrics what was he writing he was writing devotional lyrics he was a writer of devotional lyrics he had written certain devotional lyrics he was a religious poet altogether and after his death uh, we are able to see most of his writings were published but during his life lifetime only his latin poem only his latin poem that was composed in the memory of his mother was published so memoria matris sacrum which was written this is his latin poem written in memory of his mother was the only work memory of his mother was the only work that was published during his lifetime rest all of the works that were able to see is actually getting published post his lifetime rest we are able to see all the writings that are coming and he is now considered to be a, a part a member of the metaphysical school of poets right <clears throat> now what is he considered as now he is considered to be a member of the metaphysical school of poets so please remember that metaphysical group of poetry metaphysical school of poets metaphysical poetry now he is considered to be a member of that particular school so please keep that in mind i hope this is clear to everybody let's move on to the next question very very quickly so memoria matris sacrum uh, what am i planning even by youtube is that i'm trying to uh, bring across a series of webisodes for all of you and all these webisodes will try to teach you some important concept related to your exam uh, so we will practice questions uh, but at the same time you will also get a lot of help via these webisodes so i'm trying to bring across certain things uh, i just try to share the details as well and duly duly saw me but sure your point is definitely taken uh, so uh, that that really gives a lot of idea but yes like i said we will be coming up with a couple of important concept based webisodes also which you can always keep it uh, uh, downloaded as a playlist and you can refer to those uh, Uh, those those videos as well for quick revision on the topic so that is something that we are trying to come up with i'll be just sh sharing all those details as well 
In his unfinished work, in his unfinished work, New Atlantis, Francis Bacon presented the vision of an ideal education, uh, educational institute. And what was the ideal institution called? New Atlantis is a part of something which is called as your utopian literature. You will have to cover all your utopian writings and dystopian writings. Utopian literature presents an ideal world. Ideal world is something which is getting presented by the utopian writings altogether. That is what utopian writings are trying to give us a flavor of the ideal perfect society. Right? So, it is an unfinished work. This question has also come in. What is the right answer here? So, Francis Bacon's New Atlantis, it's a fictional prose piece. Remember that. Where he is telling you about the uh, future ideal world of perfection. What is the right answer? Surbi Raj has answered it correctly. Nikomoni Deka has also answered it correctly. The text is giving us a glimpse of the imaginary island of Bensalem. Right? The text is giving us this, this entire uh, imaginary island called Bensalem. And this is something that we've done actually multiple times. We've talked about how uh, Bensalem is the Bensalem is the ideal place that is being spoken about. But here, what is the question? Understand the question over here, right? So, uh, Bensalem is the island imaginary place, a utopia where people live in a state of complete harmony, complete freedom is there. One of the most unique things about the island is the existence of state-sponsored educational institute, but that state-sponsored educational institute is Salomon House. It is a state-sponsored educational institute, state-sponsored. That means state is giving you uh, the environment. State-sponsored educational institute is actually called the Salomon House. So, yes, of course, the utopian society, the utopian society which is presented, the utopian island country which is there is Bensalem. But it is not Bensalem's house. It is not Bensalem's house. It's the Salomon's house. Right. So utopian writings have to be covered. Dystopian writings have to be covered. Uh, thematically, you can cover all of them because, you know, you do get questions coming on these as well. Most of the times in your exam. So try and cover most of these topics as well because they're critical. They're crucial from your examination perspective as well. So please keep that in mind and highlight that and remember that as well. Okay, there's an assertion in recent days question, assertion, the Puritan government put a ban on the performance of plays in 1642. The Puritans were orthodox in their views and saw theater as sinful and frivolous. This is a, the reason statement. This is the assertion statement. You have to tell us what, which of the followings are, are true. I hope the uh, New Atlantis question is clear to everybody. State-sponsored educational institute is the Salomon's house. Bensalem is the utopian place. Please keep that in mind. It's a fictional prose work that we're talking about. Excellent. A is the right answer. The Puritan government stopped performance of plays. September 1642 is when they stopped the performance of the plays. September September uh, 1642 is when the Puritan government actually put a ban on the performance of the play. The long parliament of Charles I passed the order, uh, you know, ruling the ban on theatre owing to political turmoil in the state. And this actually started the period of Puritan supremacy. The ban was reinforced by Oliver Cromwell when he came to power in 1653 also. The Puritans were a faction of the Orthodox Christians. They thought that, you know, uh, that theatre is a site of moral corruption. Theater would only and only uh, try to get you in the wrong direction altogether. That was their opinion. So again, going back, revising, reviewing your Puritan literature, A is absolutely the right answer here. Both A and R are correct and R. Puritans were orthodox. They genuinely thought that theater is a, uh, is a bedrock of uh, all sorts of uh, corrupt activities that people can actually catch hold of. So, A is absolutely the right answer here, okay? Moving on to the next question, you have to match list 1 with list 2. These are the writers that you are having. These are the writers that you're having and the others are the works that are there. Sorry. What is the right answer here? Let's see how many of you are able to get the right answer. How many of you can actually answer this correctly? Uh, for how many of you, probably this is the right answer. I'm still looking forward to figuring out how many of you have answered it correctly. 
let's take it english net 2020 has answered it correctly who has answered it uh very good okay let's take it anita this guy feasting uh passing feasting novel about family living in a small indian town vikram seth has written two lives it's a piece of non-fictional work that is telling you about cross-cultural romantic relationship cross-cultural romantic relationship so uh feasting fasting this is vikram seth's two lives that we're talking about right my dateless diary is by rk narayan it is an autobio it's a it's a series of autobiographical essays that are coming in my dateless diaries my dateless diaries what are these these are autobiographical essays what are these these are autobiographical essays these are autobiographical essays these are autobiographical essays that we're talking about uh amita ghosh is associated with countdown it is non-fictional work that tells you about how uh, amita ghosh had visited pokhran pokhran is a nuclear testing site pokhran was the nuclear testing site right so countdown is literally telling you about his visit to pokhran right so this is what it, uh, what it is. Postmodern writings, postmodern Indian writings have now started coming in in a very big way. There is a proper analysis on postmodern Indian writing. People have started analyzing it in better uh, ways and format. Postmodern Indian literature is actually something which is the highlight of most of the people and their studies these days, right? So uh, otherwise also Anita Desai, one is two. Uh, so one is two. Uh, so you could have eliminated this. You could have eliminated this. You could have eliminated this b is 4 so you should have figured it out only you should have figured it out only that two lives will be there and uh, c like i said it is actually one so c is the right answer okay c is the right answer moving on to the next question which of the following plays by mahesh dattani deals with the issue of child abuse i think we are doing this question uh you know the fifth or sixth time what is the right answer here everybody what becomes the right answer here for everybody? Let's just see how many of you are able to crack the right answer here. What is the right answer? Which of the following plays by Mahesh Tattani is dealing with the issue of child abuse? It is telling you about the issue of child abuse. So which work of Dattani is actually dealing with the problem, dealing with the issue of child abuse? Child abuse is something which is being dealt with over here. Which? What is the right answer here, everybody? What becomes the right answer here for everybody? Yes, uh, that's that's absolutely right. See, uh, all these writers are important. Mahesh Tatani is, of course, an important writer as well for all of you. Uh, 30 Days in September is the right answer. It is a play that tells you about the social issue of child abuse. Mala's experience of being sexually exploited by her uncle, uh, it leaves her psychologically scarred. She's psychologically scarred. She's not able to lead a normal life after that. So 30 days in September is actually the play which is coming in, right? Uh, and this is telling you about Mala's, via Mala's story, via Mala's story, a very important uh, theme, social issue is actually getting highlighted by Mahesh Tattani. Okay, moving on to the next question. Which writer said, I'm an Indian, very brown, born in Malabar. I'm an Indian, brown, very brown, born in Malabar. Who said this? Who said this? Who said this? I'm an Indian, very brown, born in Malabar. I'm an Indian, very brown, born in Malabar. Who said this? Who was the person who said this? Let's just see how many of you can answer this question correctly. Anamali Varsi has started answering it already. Okay, let's see how many of you cracked the right answer. Yes, it is. Uh, Anamali Varsi has nailed it right. So these are these are uh, these are lines that are spoken by Kamala Das. Uh, so so there's a po poem called an introduction by Kamala Das, and in the in the poem that is written in a confessional tone, Kamala Das is talking about her pride in her identity as a female poet of India. The poem is actually telling us about the harsh criticism faced by Das for her unconventional use of language, for the kind of uh, con uh, con uh, con confessional style of writing that was used by her, the choice as a writer she was making, uh, how she was trying to disclose too much about a violent past. So that is something that people are actually discussing and she's very vocal about it. She's very, very vocal about all these concerns altogether. There's another question that is coming on post-humanism. Let's see how many of you can answer it. Uh, this is statement one and this is statement two. Let's see how many of you crack the right answer here. What is the right answer, everybody? What is the right answer for everyone? Let's just see.
Yes, everyone. What will be the right answer for everyone? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. That's right, Neha. That's right. See, post-humanism is a philosophical position uh, which is talking about re-evaluation of the word human. It is telling you that, you know, there is nothing like a transcendental humanism. It's trying to go beyond human altogether. And post-humanism thinkers, they are talking about uh, advancement in science and technology. Uh, they're trying to talk about perfectness or they, they, they're trying to question that uh, that humans are not perfect. Human are not, humans are not perfect, right? You can achieve perfection via technology altogether. Now, if you look at this question, post-humanism seeks to reconceptualize what it means to be human. Uh, that is, uh, so see, understand this. It is actually trying to go beyond human. It is not trying to revisit. It is not trying to revisit what it is to be human. It is actually going beyond that. It's saying, fine, we've understood this is what it means to be a human. Let's just go beyond this. Let's just go beyond this. Let's just not stick over here. And post-humanist thinkers, they perceive advancement of science and technology as a sort of a potential threat. Advancement of science and technology as a kind of a potential threat to uh, the so-called natural. Uh, see, see, understand this, okay? They are talking about science and technology and they do say that science and technology will devalue humans altogether. So, A, this is not true. It is not reconceptualizing. Reconceptualizing is you are reviewing it. No, it is an extension. It Everybody knows what it is to be a human. They are going beyond human. And they are saying that science and technology can actually change the pedestal that was held by humans it can actually change the pedestal that was held by humans i hope it is clear to everybody so post-humanism as post-humanism eco-criticism your quest studies these are three very important new branches of academic disciplines that you all have to definitely cover and complete Raja Rao's Kanthapura is a story of a fictional village in southern India set against the backdrop of independence movement. It is narrated by, it is narrated by, it is narrated by, who is the writer who is actually narrating it? Who is the writer who is actually narrating it? Whom are we talking about over here? Who is it that we are discussing about over here? What is the right answer here? What becomes the right answer here? Let's see how many of you are able to answer that. Okay, great, 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 great. Yes, yes, we have got the right answer. Most of you have actually nailed this question correctly. Most of you have got the right answer over here. So this is Achaka, right? This is Achaka. Rajara's debut novel, Kanthapura. What is it telling you? It is telling you the story of a southern Indian village. It is actually narrated by the elderly woman, Achaka. Elderly woman Achaka is narrating it and the novel is trying to analyze the influence of Gandhian philosophy in the pre-independence era. Murthy's character is the main character is a Brahmin who inspired by the Gandhi's pre, uh, the, you know, Gandhiji's preachings is protesting against the caste-based discrimination and he is rejecting foreign goods. He is rejecting foreign goods altogether. Right? You can also compare it to Kosi's Mandela's ego. That's a kind of cult status that even Gandhi had, the followership that Mahatma Gandhi had. Okay, moving on to the next question. The distinction between terror and horror was made in the essay on the supernatural in poetry by. On the supernatural in poetry by. Who's writing this essay? Who's writing this particular work? Who's writing this particular work? Shilpa, it's not trying to question what it is to be a human. It is just trying to go beyond human. It is just trying to talk about the fact that, you know, when you talk about the uh, emergence of so-called robots, right? And this is a question which has also been asked. So that's the same thing that they had also specified, which is absolutely true over here, right? You're not trying to change. You're not trying to establish. See, for instance, post-colonialism is not trying to, uh, you know, uh, trying to tell you that, okay, European concept is different. It's trying to replace the European con, uh, con there, there is a European understanding of the colonized uh, the colonized and they are trying to give you another fresh perspective right they are trying to give you another fresh perspective so what you are able to see is that the concept of human is already existing the concept of being human is already existing it's something which is already existing so you can't really change that at all right 
so that is the reason uh, yes shilpa great so what is the right answer here everybody what becomes the right answer here it is and radcliffe it is and radcliffe that we're talking about on the supernatural and poetry and radcliffe is trying to make a distinction between gothic between components of gothic writings and according to radcliffe terror refers to the effect that is produced by suggestions and implications while horror is generated by complete exposure of the terrible things what do we mean by that understand this terror refers to the effect produced by suggestions right it's the effect and horror is generated right so terror is something which uh, you, you might have heard about ghosts so you're terrified right you're very terrified horror is something which is coming when you actually experience it think it think it uh, through that ratcliff is saying terror is something that is coming via uh, heard stories take the example of the one that we were discussing yesterday um, in the classroom class when we were talking about edgar allan poe so edgar allan poe the house of the fall of usher so when we are talking about that so if you see uh, roderick and her sister madeline and the narrator coming and seeing so if the narrator would have only heard the story that was an example of terror but horror is something when you are actually experiencing that and and ratcliff further adds that while terror awakens the soul and makes one aware that fear is present only in our minds horror is something because you know you've experienced it yourself so it paralyzes you right you you're totally confused terror is still like okay you've understood that okay uh, uh, all uh, all sorts of uh, you know uh, kachra has gone into your head because of the fact that you know you've started believing in ghosts so then you're trying to remove that that okay no it was my fault it was my error but horror is something that you know you're like no i've seen a ghost yourself so then it's even more difficult for you to understand it right so uh, and actually fear is making that please add this to your graveyard poets uh, notes please add this to your gothic literature notes by now you should have ideally made notes on both gothic literature as well as graveyard school of poetry you do get questions coming on both of them uh, these are all important categories utopian dystopian and gothic graveyard all of these are important categories the concept of primary and secondary imagination was introduced by this is like a really simple question and i want all of you to answer it correctly what is the right answer here for everybody the concept of primary and secondary imagination was introduced by who's introducing the concept of primary and secondary imagination who's the person who's giving us this entire concept of primary uh, imagination and secondary imagination who is this person that we are talking about let's see how many of you get the right answer yes coderich is the right answer coderich is absolutely the right answer here for most of us um i don't think this needs any sort of explanation because when we are looking at coderich as a critic uh, we have been discussing he's a writer of sibylline leaves he's a writer who's writing biographia literaria he's writing lectures on shakespeare from 1808 to 1819 uh, he's also a person who is known for the vast oeuvre of uh, poetic creations like christabel kubla khan uh, rhyme of the ancient mariner so couple of uh, works uh, importantly coming in primary imagination allows us to see the world around us right and secondary imagination is having ism plastic imagination secondary imagination what is it having secondary imagination is a sort of an ism plastic ism plastic imagination the ability to stretch you are having the ability to stretch aesthetic creation artistic creation is possible uh after you have reconstructed whatever you have felt reconstructing the senses impressions are coming only via primary imagination but poetic creation is possible via secondary imagination poetic creation is actually something which is uh, which is uh, uh, which which is possible only because of the secondary imagination that we are looking at okay here we go now is the winter of our discontent where are these lines coming from where are these lines coming in from where are we able to see that these lines are the line now is the winter of our discontent now is the winter of our discontent let's just see just give me quick oh, one second i'm just getting the bottle filled over here one second everyone yes please answer this question in the meantime
Right, so what is the right answer here? And I'm so glad that I, I went because there was something on the... Oh God. All right, let's just see how many of you get the right answer here. Probably keep my bottle aside and have it later. Yes, uh, so here when we are looking at, of course, you get quotations coming in every now and then. Uh, if you look at now is the winter of our discontent. Now is the winter of our discontent. So these lines are coming in Richard the Three, Richard the uh, Third. So uh, William Shakespeare's Richard the Third in the very first scene of Richard the Third, we can actually see that Richard of uh, Gloucester is uh, a very scheming, treacherous kind of a person, and he's plotting to use serve the throne of England. He is wanting to take control of the throne of England and he describes how the turbulent years of the War of Roses have come to an end because of the accession of his brother Edward V to the, England, uh, to the English throne. Richard feels that this is the ideal moment to take a decisive action and take power in his hands. So he is very scheming, very shrewd, very calculative right extremely scheming so that is now is the winter of our discontent richard the third right important lines are coming from history plays of shakespeare i think yesterday also most of you when we were doing a uh, crash course on drama via questions uh, oh, this reminds me, I'll share the PDFs also with all of you, uh, right? Uh, so, so even in Crash Course of Drama, all of you had agreed that we need to take the historical plays also very seriously, complete the synopsis, understand the, the plays and make proper notes on the historical plays as well. Let's move on to the next question now. Let's just quickly move on and head to the next question and see how many of you get the right answer here. Okay, let's see how many of you are able to. Angela Carter's novella, The Bloody Chamber, is a feminist retelling of, it's a feminist retelling of the Bluebird Tale. Bluebird Tale. A lot of you are writing A, a lot of you are also writing B. Okay, Angela Carter's 1979 novella, The Bloody Chamber, it is a modern retelling of the Bluebird Folktale, right? The Bluebird Folktale. This question also, by the way, we've actually done and Bluebird Folktale with a feminist ending. She's giving a sort of a feminist ending to the Bluebird uh, tale altogether. What was the Bluebird Folktale? So what happens is that in Angela Carter's tale, the narrator is a young virginal woman who marries the French Marquise only to learn that he is a murderer. However, unlike the girl in the original story, the Bluebird Folktale, where the protagonist is rescued by her brothers, Angela Carter's heroine is saved by her feisty and fearless mother. So the mother saves the daughter. The mother saves the daughter, not the brothers, not the brothers. So the bluebird tail, the bluebird tail over here is the right answer. So please remember the bloody chamber, the bloody chamber, the wife is actually getting saved, not by her brother, uh, not by the brothers, but by the mother. The bluebird tail is something which it's being retold, right? It's being retold from the feminist perspective. Please remember that. Okay, very simple question about your alienation effect is the key principle of the dramatic theory proposed by proposed by social drama, political drama, uh, your uh, so-called drama of the 20th century, which is socially purposive. Uh, this is, of course, important. Let's see how many of you are able to answer this question correctly. Yes. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. This is the right answer. So here, please keep that in mind. These kind of questions are really simple over here. Uh, so Bertolt Brecht, Brecht, Brechtian idea, the V effect that we're talking about. Uh, so what is Brecht trying to talk about? Brecht is actually trying to talk about the alienation effect. And, uh, you know, this was again, a, a widely, widely contented, a very con contentious issue altogether. Epic theaters, premises by German playwright Bertolt Brecht. Uh, according to Brecht's theory, the audience needs to be completely emotionally estranged 
they should be emotionally distanced because otherwise when they have catharsis they just have catharsis and they forget about the original problem they just go on with life as usual they just completely forget about the main problem altogether they 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 completely forget about the main problem altogether that is what we are able to see and understand okay moving on the metrical foot known as anapist comprises of rhetoric and prosody also has to be done comprises of comprises of the metrical foot anapist comprises of anapist comprises of the metrical foot anapist comprises of anapist is comprising of what anapist is comprising of what let's just see how many of you get the right answer here the metrical foot known as anapist comprises of what is it comprising of yes absolutely right that is the right answer so it is having two unstressed syllables very good anamali avarsi is on fire it is having two unstressed syllables followed by one stressed syllable right followed by one stressed syllable not like dactylic dactylic is actually a little different right dactylic is more like you know you are having the stressed unstressed unstressed it's like a finger it's like the index finger this this box is bigger then these two boxes are smaller so stress tam stress tam stress that's dactylic most of the epics are written in dactylic anapist is a metrical foot where you are having two unstressed syllables followed by one stressed syllable right so there are two unstressed syllables that are there and then it is followed by one stressed syllable rhetoric and prosody please cover it take it uh, give it importance because rhetoric and prosody come what may no matter how they change the uh, the the way uh, the syllabus is going to be structured but rhetoric and prosody questions or questions questions on literary terms will definitely be there altogether okay moving on which of the following is not an epistolary novel what is the an epistolary novel epistles letter writings right so which is not an example of epistolary writing let's see how many of you are able to get the right answer which of the following is not an epistolary writing it is not an example of an epistolary writing altogether let's see how many of you uh, are able to crack the right answer here see epistolary novels are uh, written in the form of journal, journal entries emails now letter writing documents uh, henry fielding's shamila uh, braham stoker's dracula william golding's rites of the passage these are all examples of epistolary writings but joseph andrews is not joseph andrews is not an example of epistolary writing right joseph andrews which is written by henry fielding is not an example of epistolary format right it's not exactly an epistolary format that we are talking about as such all right the rest of them frankenstein also there are uh, uh, letters that are getting exchanged all together yes it's it's a it's a picturesque work it's picturesque work uh, it is a comic epic in prose comic epic in prose is also another important category that henry fielding is introducing sara fielding the sister there have been questions coming on her and her writings david simple is an important work altogether so those kind of questions have also started coming which of the following is not a play by george etheridge george etheridge again drama 17th century drama restoration comedy restoration drama this also has to be on your fingertips because again questions are coming in the country wife is the right answer here the country wife d d d ya tamina kuhu sutpa siali everybody before siali also was right uh, right everybody uh, before siali is also right country wife is the right answer so george etheridge who's coming from the rest coming in the restoration period right his plays are classified as comedy of manners right where uh, a lot of uh, important writings were coming in you are having wycherley you are having vanbro you are having otway you are having more tragedy and comedy writers restoration drama is a huge uh, oeuvre that we are talking about comical revenge she could if she would man of the mode these are all by etheridge country wife is written by wycherley in 1675 this is a play by wycherley this is a work by william wycherley right so country wife is is not uh, something which is the creation altogether of etheridge it is rather written by wycherley this is a work of writing that is associated with william wycherley please remember that country wife 1675 it is a work of wycherley 
right so please keep that in mind ward shoinka's play death and the king's horseman deals with an ancient ward shoinka the writer uh, the african writer african origin writer receiving the nobel prize as well ward shoinka's play death and the king's horseman deals with an ancient deals with an uh, ancient what deals with an ancient what Yes, absolutely right. Absolutely right. This is the correct answer. Again, African writing, simple questions come in, but we have to complete all of them. It is dealing with the Yoruba tradition. It is dealing with the Yoruba tradition. He is a Nigerian playwright. He is recipient of the Nobel Prize. And the events in the play are based on the real life incident where the sacrifice of a horseman after the death of a Yoruba king was being followed. Right? It was a tribal tradition which which prevailed, but it was prevented by the colonial authorities. Colonial authorities said you cannot sacrifice a horse after the Yoruba king's death. You cannot actually do this kind of an act of cruelty altogether. So the Yoruba tradition of how you were killing the horsemen and uh, after the Yoruba king would actually die, but this particular practice was prevented by the colonial authorities. The colonial authorities prevented such action. They said this kind of an action is not required at all. This is just showing heinous crimes altogether. Evelina is a novel written by Evelina is a novel written by who's the writer writing Evelina? Who's the writer who's writing Evelina? Evelina is a novel written by who's the writer of Evelina? Who's the writer who's writing Evelina? Who's the writer who's writing Evelina? Evelina is a work written by. Yes, absolutely right. So again, women writings, uh, prose writings particularly, they are of course important. Fanny Burney is absolutely the right answer. Evelina or a young lady's entrance into the world. I think we've done it multiple times. This is also an epistolary writing. The eponymous heroine. Um, Evelina is abandoned by her father when she was young and she's brought up by a guardian. Her inability to understand the social customs on her introduction to the London society is, of course, the main reason why this work was actually uh, trying to help us understand the story altogether. You know, the novel became a huge success after it was published uh, by Fanny Burney. It was a huge, huge success altogether. So, Evelina, uh, a, a young lady's entrance into the world, the subtitle is also important. The next question coming from from Gulliver's Travels. Let's see how many of you get the right answer. In the third part of Gulliver's Travels, the protagonist travels to. The protagonist travels to. Where is the protagonist traveling to? Where is the protagonist traveling to? In the third part of Gulliver's Travels, the protagonist is traveling to. Where is the protagonist traveling to? Which part, which place is the protagonist traveling to? So the protagonist travels to some place. So which part of the uh, country is the protagonist traveling to? Let's see how many of you get the right answer. Third part. Third part. Third part. How is Brobdignat coming in the third part, everybody? This is like... Oh my god, all of you who are saying C, I feel like, you know, literally banging my head against the wall, literally, after listening to Bob Dignag. How is Bob Dignag coming in the third part? This is like, this is Harakari. How can you do that? No, Bob Dignag is not coming. That, folks, what's wrong with all of you? You need to wake up now. This is high time. You can't go wrong with that. Lilliput, Bob Dignag, Laputa, Honanam Land. It should be on your fingertips. Right? It has to be on your fingertips. So many of you, so many of you are giving the wrong answer. How can this be possible? That means we all need to revise. I'll, I'll probably try to figure out some extra sessions as well. Laputa. The third part is Laputa. The Flying Island. Remember? The Flying Island. It's a critique of the Royal Society. It's a critique of the London Royal Society. The London Royal Society was getting critiqued over here. 
for the mindless experiments that you're conducting even right now when we are talking about nuclear advancement or advancement into uh, say ai artificial intelligence or uh, your crypto blockchain etc what about uh, you know the other half of the planet which is absolutely untouched with even the basic requirements they're so poor poverty stricken so that's the same thing that swift was actually talking about What's up with all of you now? This is giving a panic attack. Okay, which of the following poems by Sylvia Plath is a vanilla? Is a vanilla? What is the right answer here? Yes, L B L H. Very good, Somi. L B L H. Good, good, good. Please don't go wrong with these kind of questions for sure. Okay. What is the right answer here? Which of the following poems by Plath is an example of a vanilla? Let's see how many of you are able to crack the right answer here. Please read it properly. Don't be in a hurry to answer. It's perfectly all right to give wrong answers altogether, right? So in the third part of Jonathan Swift's book, what we are able to see: first part, Lilliput, Brobdingnag; second part, third part is the Flying Island of Laputa, right? That is what we are able to see: satire on the Royal Society, and here also Mad Girl's Love Song. What is a vanilla? Vanilla is a poetic form in which poems are written in five three-line stanzas. Five three-line stanzas, right? Two sets and a final quatrain. So there are five three-line stanzas. There are five. Three line stanzas, three line stanzas, also called tercet, followed by one quatrain, followed by one quatrain. This is called a vanilla. This is the structure of a vanilla. There are five tercets that are there. There are five three line stanzas that are there, and then there is a final quatrain. Right, and these poems therefore are having nineteen because you know if you if you just look at it, ah, uh, three into five is fifteen plus four is nineteen. They are having nineteen lines if you look at it mathematically. That's a vanilla. I hope that is clear to everybody. Sylvia Plath experimented with this form in Mad Girl's Love Song. Which she was writing when she was, uh, you know, uh, when uh, she wrote this while she was a student at Cambridge. Uh, the work is dealing with several themes like heartbreak, psychological breakdown, just like we saw Kamala Das writing on confessional topics. Plath was also a confessional poet, right? So psychological breakdown, heartbreak all together. Uh, so please, I hope it's clear that there are 19 lines that we're able to see in a vanilla, the the art form that we're talking about, right? Again, rhetoric and prosody only. And Mad Girl's Love Song when she was at Cambridge. Cambridge. When she was at Cambridge, was the work that was written. Plath is an important 20th century poet. Has to be done in a little great detail. You can make short little notes on that. Which theorist described postmodernism as incredulity towards meta narratives? As incredulity towards meta narratives. So, which postmodern has described uh, postmodernism as incredulity towards meta narratives? Which theorist describe postmodernism as incredulity towards meta narratives? Incredulity towards meta narratives. Which work are we talking about over here? Which theorist is describing postmodernism as incredulity towards meta narrative? Incredulity towards meta narrative. Which theorist are we talking about over here? So it's really simple question. Everybody should get it right, right? Nobody should get it wrong. This is something. Lyotha, there's a person who's talking about it in postmodernism. Incredulity towards meta narrative. Leotard is writing the postmodern condition, which is actually telling us postmodernism is nothing but incredulity towards meta narratives. Leotard says that postmodernism is characterized by distrust of meta narratives, the grand narratives that we are having, right? So postmodernism is actually focusing on what local narrative, petit rectus, petit rectus. What is it focusing on? It's focusing on petit rectus. What is petit rectus? Petit rectus is nothing but your local Local narratives that we are talking about, right? These are your local narrative. Petit rectus is equal to your local narratives that are coming, rather than focusing on grand narratives, mega narratives, uh, meta narratives. You are focusing on local narratives, right? That is telling about fluid fluidity of truth. There is no one single overarching truth. There is no one single overarching truth that we are having. Okay, the biography of Mary Wollstonecraft's uh, Wollstonecraft memoir of the author of a vindication of the rights of woman, right? The biography, biography of Mary Wollstonecraft memoirs of the author of a vindication of the rights of woman was written by. We just had a lecture on Mary Wollstonecraft as well. You can add this question to that particular lecture as well.
Nice, Tahmina. I'm so glad that you remembered it. Okay, what is the right answer here, everybody? Yes, absolutely right. Absolutely right. Uh, this is written by Godwin. Godwin is the person who's actually writing this. Godwin is the writer who's writing this. So the 18th century writer Mary Wollstonecraft's biography, Memoirs of the Author of a Vindication of the Rights of Woman, was written by her husband Godwin. Mary Wollstonecraft is a woman who was writing about uh, feminism. She was, she of course died a few days after the childbirth of Mary Shelley. Mary Shelley's birth, she actually, uh, she passed away. She had a difficult uh, journey. Or overall, she had two scandalous affairs as well. And finally, she got married to William Godwin. Uh, she also had a child with her first, uh, uh, you know, the first two romantic affairs that she had. One of them also bore her a child. So that is, of course, there. <coughs> okay, uh, let's move on to the next question. Next question is simple. So I hope this is clear. This is Godwin is the right answer here. Godwin himself is writing the biography. Uh, which of the following is an unfinished work by William Wordsworth? It is an unfinished work by William Wordsworth. William Wordsworth did not actually finish this. It's an unfinished work by William Wordsworth. Which one are we talking about? Yes, Imlay is the right answer. Very good. Very good, Babita. Very nice. Very nice. Uh, which is the unfinished work that we are talking about? Yes, absolutely right. Recluse is the unfinished work. Bharat, Anna, everybody got it right. Very good. Anna was the first person to get it right. Uh, so this is the recluse. It's the unfinished, long, philosophical poem by Wordsworth. Uh, the poem we now read as the prelude was supposed to be the preface to the recluse. Prelude was supposed to be the preface to the recluse. Uh, the work that we now read as prelude, it was supposed to be, that was the vision. It had to be the preface to recluse. That was supposed to be the vision. Wordsworth's ambitious project that we had, it was supposed to be a three-part long epic altogether. Uh, it was supposed to be a three-part long epic that we had, right? That, that was the original intention. Okay, let's look at the question, the next set of question, list one, list two, you have to match the following in list one and list two. I want you all to match the following, uh, like do the match the following also rightly. What is the right answer here? Let's just see how many of you can match it correctly, appropriately. What is the right answer? Okay, fine. That's great. That's great. That's great. Yes, absolutely right. A is the right answer. Most of you are answering it correctly. Old by Tale is a satirical play by George Peel. Philip Sidney is writing Arcadia. Erasmus is writing The Praise of Folly, which is actually a satirical work again, attacking superstitions of the Western Church. Euphius is written by John Lilly, which is a prose romance, right? Very simple question. So George Peel is writing Old Wives Tale. Uh, first is only there, which is having fourth. So A is the right answer. Okay. Philip Sidney is writing Arcadia. Erasmus is writing In Praise of Human Folly. Lilly is writing Euphius, right? So this is the right answer. In his memoir, Running in the Family, writer Michael Ondaatje returns to his native country. Which country is he returning to? So, memoirs, Michael Ondaatje, the Canadian Sri Lankan writer, Sri Lankan born Canadian writer, Sri Lankan origin Canadian writer, so to say, uh, writing the English patient, writing a Booker Award winning writer over here, uh, writing Anil's Ghost as well. What is the right answer here? What is the right answer here? This is a fairly simple question. Two memoirs so far we've talked about. <coughs> Nikomoni has answered it correctly. Sri Lanka is the right answer. So, running in the family, what you are able to see is that the Canadian writer Michael Ondaatje is returning to his native island of Sri Lanka, where he had spent his formative years also. And the memoir is telling you the story of Ondaatje, uh, his search for already diseased father he got separated from as a child. And, you know, the narrative, uh, narrator is trying to look at personal anecdotes of the author, the history uh, of the country where he was born. He's trying to reclaim that history of sorts right that is what he's trying to do okay the real name of artful dodger in charles dickens oliver twist in charles dickens oliver twist artful dodger in charles dickens oliver twist what is the real name 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 what becomes the real name let's see how many of you can answer it the real name of artful dodger in charles dickens oliver twist this is like a really simple one, not that difficult at all. So there is, everybody should be getting the right answer so far. 
Artful Dodger. Yes, Tabassum has got it right. Tabassum Jannat is absolutely right. So here it's Jack Dawkins. Jack Dawkins, right? So Artful Dodger, the pickpocketer, the leader of the criminal gang of Fagin. Fagin is Jack Dawkins. Right, the Fagin, F A G I N. Uh, he's very sharp, very cunning. He tries to teach Oliver Twist the uh, the various aspects of pickpocketing, and he realizes that uh, that you know uh, that that Oliver Twist can never master it. He is also one who introduces Oliver to Fagin also in a way, right? He's introducing Oliver to Fagin as well. So um, please keep that in mind because a lot of times these kind of questions about real names are coming. Jack Dawkins is the right answer here. Which of these poems by Sappho was hailed by Longinus as the supreme example of sublime? Please add it to your notes on Longinus on the sublime. Just add this particular question on your notes on the sublime, right? Your the notes that you've written on the sublime. Just add it to those notes all together as well. This is how you're going to build your notes all together, and you will try to advance to writing highly, uh, like you know, updated notes all together. What is the right answer here? What becomes the right answer here? Yes, absolutely right. Jealousy ode is the right answer. Jealousy ode is the right answer. Jealousy ode is absolutely the right answer. Okay, so do make it a point that uh, you know you you are also looking at classical writings. You can update this on in the Longinus part as well. Jealousy ode is written by Sappho. Sappho is uh, considered to be hailed as the tenth muse, so to say. And you know, according to Longinus's theory of sublimity. He's giving you on the sublime, and he's telling you that greatness of a work is the ability to transport the reader, to uh, you know, transport the reader altogether to another realm because of the beauty and grandeur of the work. Longinus is actually hailing Sappho, so he says that the jealousy ode, the jealousy ode, is the supreme example of sublime. It is a supreme example of sublime according to Longinus. This becomes a supreme example of the sublime altogether. Okay, Mary Ann Evans was the assistant editor of the journal. Mary Ann Evans was the assistant editor for the journal. Assistant editor for the journal. Which journal are we talking about, Mary Ann Evans? Which journal is this that we are looking at? Mary Ann Evans was the assistant editor of the journal. Which journal is this? Which journal is this? Which journal is this? Which journal is this? Okay, I I'm just waiting for most of you to answer this question so that we can just quickly proceed to this. Nicomoni has got it right. It is the Westminster's Review. Uh, Mary Ann Evans' 19th century novels have to be done in greater detail. Uh, Mary Ann Evans published her novels under the pseudonym of George Eliot, and uh, she was the assistant editor for the British Quarterly Journal called the Westminster's Review. This was a British Quarterly Journal. And Mary Ann Evans, uh, she uh, she preached progressive and liberal ideals. She was talking about how uh, you are not supposed to be conservative in your outlooks at all, right? You're not supposed to be con conservative in your outlook at all. You need to change and reform altogether. Moving on to another question here. This is statement one, and this is statement two. And after this, I will pause. I'll tell you why because of two to three reasons, and then we'll continue uh, after this, and then we'll continue after this. Uh, statement one is there, and statement two is there. Statement one is there, and statement two is there. Statement one and statement two. Okay. Right. Uh, so let's let's just take it. Let's just take it point by point. The reform bills of 19th century were intended to transform the contemporary educational system. We just did this question uh, one or two days ago. This is not true. It wanted to get in. Uh, it wanted to basically extend electorate rights. Right. It guaranteed education is uh, education to every child below the age of 12. So that is correct. So uh, what you're uh, sorry that is also not correct because it wasn't giving uh, you know the reform bills were not giving any. Uh, 
educational rights it was just giving and franchisement rights so both statement 1 and statement 2 are incorrect both statement 1 and statement 2 are incorrect because that was not the purpose of reform bills the three reform bills wanted to give male and franchisement male voting rights they were extending male voting rights it was the age of reform because every uh, citizen every male citizen had actually got the voting rights altogether that is what the reform bills were doing that is what the reform bills were actually trying to do so the number of reform the three reform bills that were coming in they wanted to give in electoral rights altogether right uh, we'll pause over here i'll tell you for two reasons uh, a i think we did about 30 questions yesterday also and this makes it 30 more so 60 questions uh, in the coming days again we'll circle back i will uh, you know from next week onwards when we meet uh, for the sunday class we'll actually be covering 100 questions itself so please build a little bit of stamina as well and come prepared for uh, you know questions that are going to be hundred in number i will try to make it a mix of both i will try to make it like a mix of mcq type questions some uh, 10 questions which can be like a single one liner answer as well so that you know over the course of this entire week you can actually prepare well uh, having said that why am i stopping over here today because i really want all of you to go over drama revise drama try to complete drama try to make structured notes on each and every period of drama as well because that is what we were looking at yesterday as well right so try and go over it try and make sure that you're all very clear about drama that should be a priority immediately for everybody right that should ideally be a priority all of you should try and cover drama uh you know properly uh and let's just uh let's just uh wrap it up over here any other details that you want please feel free to let us know about it uh study well try to complete drama try to wrap up drama uh entirely uh make small crisp notes on drama that is of course something which is required and uh, just make sure that you know you're being very organized for these sessions as well so that they can be more fruitful it's just not solving a question it's understanding which topic is important and seeing whether you have revised that topic or not that is becoming a priority and uh, even on the youtube we'll try to to bring in a couple of concept classes small lectures as well so that you're able to review you're able to revise you're able to see whether your preparation is actually up to the mark for the upcoming exams or not right thank you so much everyone for joining i really appreciate you coming on a sunday mother's day uh curtailing your celebrations in between of thanking your moms um thanks atan for joining me in i'll catch up with all of you very very soon thanks uh atan god bless take good care of yourselves um thank you everyone thank you thank you uh yes uh thank you thank you thank you thank you right so man is saying bye challengers okay bye challengers take care everyone good night sweet dreams take good care of yourselves everyone bye take care god bless thank you everyone